Hey y'all, thanks for clicking on the video. Uh, my name is David Boyce, author from 52 Churches in 52 Weeks, which was a spiritual memoir that chronicled uh, my one year trying to visit a new church each week just to kind of figure out where I stood with, with God, religion, what have you. Um, basically a, a deconstruction phase uh, before deconstruction became a popular buzzword like it is nowadays. Um, when I was doing this, I had, I tried to do as many denominations as possible, Catholic, Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopal, Greek Orthodox, Christian science, what have you. But by far, whether it was from a believer, a non-believer, agnostic, what have you, the top request I always got from people was Dave you have to check out a Scientology church service. So in today's video, we're going to go into that one time I walked off the street and into a Scientology church to kind of see what happened. And it is different uh, than what you may be accustomed to if you go into a Christian church, that's for sure. Um, in the video, like typically in these videos, like I, I try and do like some type of script or some type of outline, so I have a couple talking points. For this video, I'm just gonna word vomit, and like I don't really have anything planned. I all I know is I got a couple different things I'll show you. Like uh, this is essentially be like a show and tell uh, with some of the DVDs and that I got when I was there. So I'll kind of mention uh, a little bit about these. Um, I also got an order form, so I'll kind of go into what Scientology does uh, to bring in some money. And then also, um, I'll also show what I got in the mail uh, from the church uh, two to three months after my visit. So, yeah, just going to word vomit, just bleh, everything that I experienced that day. Uh, so, so bring a towel. So uh, before I get any further, um, if you like to support this work, uh, hit the like button on the video and hit subscribe to stay up to date for any kind of future content. If you really want to help out, uh, I do have my book, 52 Churches in 52 Weeks, with that you can purchase on Amazon. That goes into every single visit. Uh, the book, it is free if you have a Kindle Unlimited subscription. Uh, also, it's available in ebook, paperback, and now in hardcover, though I've seen the hardcover takes several weeks to arrive as of right now. So we'll get right into this video. So for Scientology, um, when I went, um, and now I should also mention, looking at their website now, the one that I went to, they don't actually have church services anymore. You can go for the visitor center, but to actually attend a church service that ended not too long after I visited. So the one I went to was in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, right around Minneapolis. This was before the pandemic. This was before the George Floyd riots. Uh, so I'm sure a lot has changed uh, since I made my one visit. But the one I went to, it used to be a science museum. And if you wanted to attend church, um, there were two ways to do it. Uh, you could either uh, request a reservation by enrolling online, which I did one time, but then I no-showed, so that was my bad. Um, or what I did the second time was just walk off the street, walk in, and request to go to the church service. So when I got there, um, there were two attendants at the front desk. And they were both wearing the same type of uniform. And as I went, as I kind of perused around later on during my visit, uh, I want to say four or five uh, different gals all wearing the same exact thing. White collared t-shirts with vests. In the book, I thought that they had gold vests, but I came across an old photo where, oh, they actually wear black vests with black pants. When I got there, I asked to go to the church service, and uh, the one lady advised that she had to take my contact information. And 
I was a little bit leery about that. Um, like I had known with Scientology, like it had been abducted uh, by all these rumors and documentaries and all kinds of different stuff out there. I was trying to be unbiased. So I gave my contact information, what have you. I was doing a side experiment on the side anyway, where I would, if they would ask me for contact information, whether it was like through a, uh, a registry or a visitor booklet or something, I'd give it out to kind of see what the church would do to follow up with me. So I gave that to them. And then the one uh, lady attendant, uh, she advised that I follow her and sat me in this really nice state-of-the-art cafeteria area. Had a bunch of bowls with all kinds of fruits and snacks to chew on. And she gave me like the world's smallest water bottle. And she basically told me just to sit tight and uh, someone would meet with me later. So that in itself was really made me a little paranoid. Here I am trying to go to church. This was the only time I'd ever requested to go to church. And I was basically placed in a waiting room. So time passed. Uh, five minutes, 10 minutes, I'm just sitting there. And the only people that were walking in, and now granted, with this cafeteria, I'm the only person there. There's no one around me. The only people that are walking in are people that have like workout clothes and gym bags. And they're going to this other room that I can't see. I can't actually, I never actually visited. So that was a little different. And when the, the clock struck the point where I think it was like five minutes after the service was supposed, was supposed to start, um, I didn't mention this in the book, like I got rid of it just due to editing, but I came up to the front desk and I asked the lady again, it's like, you know, what, you know, did you forget about me? Like, where's the church service? And she asked, Hey, you know, the chaplain, he's on his way. We didn't forget you, you know, sit back where you were. So it's like, all right, fine, whatever. So the paranoia starts to play at me more. Like, what are they doing anything with my contact information? Are all these rumors, uh, like I start getting more, more, more and more and more paranoid about why I'm waiting for so long. So I go up to the front desk for a second time. And finally the chaplain arrives and the chaplain, he's an older gentleman. Uh, he's, I could smell cigarette smoke off of him and he had the whole, um, Catholic garb pretty much, you know, black dressed and then with the white clerical collar, uh, around the neck. Now here's what's really different. So he, he, he shakes my hand, he looks me in the eye and then he reads me this. Yeah, I shouldn't say read, I'm going to read it for you because he just said this off the top of his head. And so this is how he introduced himself. So there was an astronaut who landed on an alien planet inhabited by a race of beautiful women. When he climbed out of his spaceship, the women approached, and he saw that they were all some 20 feet taller than he was. One came up to him and asked, I suppose you want to see our leader. The astronaut looked up at her and replied, Take me to your ladder. I'll see your leader later. And my eyes just lit up like deer in headlights. Like, I'm already paranoid. I don't know why no one else is going to the church service. Why are all these people coming in workout clothes and not going to church? And that's the, my introduction uh, to someone who is a Scientologist. It was so, so bizarre. And the chaplain, he laughed. You know, he introduced himself. And he came to sit with me. And we just started shooting the breeze. And, and truth be told, like the, the chaplain, just absolutely great guy. Uh, he was really, really kind. He always answered any kind of questions that I had. And, but at the same time, like, so there was a certain sense of relief that, okay, I'm late for the church, but I can't be late for church because the preacher, the pastor, the chaplain, he's right with me. So where is everyone else? So eventually, and this is such a Midwest thing, he just kind of threw his his hands on his knees and 
you know, well, I suppose we're the only ones that are going to be here today. And he told me like, they usually had four or five regulars. None of them came and we would just do church, just me and him. Um, probably, yeah, it was the only church service I attended where I was the lone congregant. Um, so really he basically turned into my tour guide at the same time because with the Scientology Visitor Center, uh, there's tons, and, and this is the thing that Scientology does absolutely fantastically. They have all these visually attractive click and play panels inside the visitor center. Like you click on this little button, there's this huge display, and then the video will play. And within about two or three, four minutes, you can learn all about uh, a Scientology term or practice or what have you and learn it immediately to kind of have a good idea about what it is. So there are a few that I played around with, and, and I think one of the biggest ones was Dianetics. And uh, Dianetics, it's probably one of the most famous books uh, that the Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard wrote, and L. Ron Hubbard, he looks a little bit like that, where Dianetics is essentially uh, a book that Hubbard wrote that really launched Scientology. It really talks about uh, the way that the display showed it is we have two different minds. We have an analytical mind, one that's rational, one that is uh, that kind of has the consciousness. And then you also have the reactive mind. And the reactive mind is what you typically see with post-traumatic stress disorder or um, you know, a negative event like a horrible breakup or you go to war and you get shot at and you witness someone that dies. The reactive mind shatters the analytical mind and this kind of brings the whole idea of Dianetics to kind of bring you to your clear, to bring you to your wholeness. And Dianetics, from what I understood, kind of addressed that. So there's something called an auditing process where an auditee and an auditor work together using something that's called an e-meter. And they had one of these on display uh, when I was there. So the e-meter, um, the auditor will ask the auditee tons of different kinds of questions, almost like a counseling, almost like a traumatic counseling type of session. And the, the e-meter it's almost kind of like a poly polygraph test where the oddity is supposed to hold the cans. So they hold the cans and then the e-meter will do all these different types of polygraph type of um, tests that the auditor who's been trained on this for a number of years will be able to interpret to help them become more whole, to address any kind of traumatic situations from the past that may be influencing their present. All about pers personal efficiency uh, that can hold us back. Um, there are other type of displays. I remember uh, the chaplain also talked to me a little bit about why, because I had a question about all these different people that were coming in. They weren't coming to church, but they were going with all their workout clothes. So from what I understood, he told me like there, there's like this detox process like you go to a sauna, there's a little, I don't know if he told me there was a workout room or not, uh, but you take this pill and you're supposed to be able to detox uh, any type of dangerous toxins within your system. And the pill is supposed to help that come out of you is from what I remember. And I can't remember if he offered one to me or not. I don't think so. Um, I was going to say no. Uh, but it was, it was strange to hear him talk about that because I could smell the cigarette smoke off of him. And so it's like, why? Like, I, I, I wasn't going to take it from that guy um, after being able to smell him for so long. Because, you know, if you don't want toxins, then don't smoke cigarettes before you visit. Um, eventually, uh, he had uh, he invited me up then for the actual church service. And when you're walking around the visitor center and you're walking up there, there are just tons and tons of images of L. Ron Hubbard that are everywhere. Like Scientology, 
adores its founder. So I had to go through this uh, almost like constellations of offices on the second floor and had to go through this winding hallway into a huge lecture, lecture room, uh, probably s seated at least like 200 people. And there was this huge grand piano on one side. There was a Scientology pulpit with the logo in the center. And then there was also a big book um, that I'm sure uh, had a lot of different type of Scientology uh, type of wording in there. So uh, the chaplain, and he told me, it's like, because it's just me and you, if you got any questions, just interrupt me during the sermon, which I didn't really do. I just wanted him to do his own thing. And he, uh, first he had to cite the creed of Scientology. I can't remember it, uh, but I'm sure you could Google search it to learn what that is. And then he went into his sermon that he had prepared. And uh, the sermon was really different. Uh, he, I remember him talking about uh, a mosquito. And if you kill the mosquito, you know, it's not a, such a huge deal. But if the mosquito is carrying malaria and the mosquito starts biting people and killing them with the malaria, then it is your duty to kill the mosquito with malaria. And in the back of my head, I'm just like, how am I supposed to know a mosquito is carrying malaria? Um, then he started going, and I'm, I'm just going to read this from the book because um, it's so different to me. Uh, he start, So after a 10-minute lecture on what's right and what's wrong, he moved on to talk about arguments within a relationship and how I should always find out why my girlfriend is right. So for example, if she's always burning dinner and it leads to several big arguments, I need to wipe out her wrongness by asking, what would be right about burning my dinner? So as he explained, this can evoke a raging tirade, but if one flattens the question, which by continue, continuing to ask it until it no longer produces a reaction, she will happily cease to burn dinner. This can happen with your girlfriend. And then he paused and continued with a spirit of political correctness or boyfriend. So whatever floats your boat. Uh, but after the sermon, I, you know, it was such a different type of sermon because one of the problems I had as I was going through my faith journey was if I went to a church without, without the cross at the center, it always really bothered me and I never really felt spiritually full. So to have a, a Scientology service, now granted, with Scientology, it doesn't really um, say that you can't be Christian. You can be Christian and you can be a Scientologist. You can be Jewish and you can be a Scientologist. You can be a Buddhist and a, and a Scientologist. Some of the New Age religions, what, what I noticed was they would kind of be umbrellas on top of the other type of religions. So that would hopefully bring in more people. Uh, but without you know God or Christ, it was so different to hear a sermon in a church or a church and, and not get that um, that I had been used to. So eventually, um, after the sermon, he, uh, the chaplain just let me peruse a little bit more. And again, super friendly. Um, I had another girl came up to me uh, who was one of the staffers and, you know, really nice again. Um, no one was rude. No one was a jerk. And I just kind of kept looking around. Um, one thing that I noticed was uh, there was an office for L. Ron Hubbard, an absolutely beautiful office. Uh, looks like the only people that could go inside were Hubbard and, um, now granted, he's, he's passed away, um, but in whoever was cleaning the office. Uh, there were also click and play displays for Hubbard where uh, when you're watching any of the videos that they present to you, like he comes across as one of the most adventured, most sophisticated men that have ever walked the planet. Uh, if you ever seen that one movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks, I think uh, Catch Me If You Can, where DiCaprio plays 
uh, this one guy that can get away with being a lawyer, a pilot, a doctor, like he can do it all. Like Hubbard comes across as that. So with the videos, they present that he was born in Tilden, Nebraska, lived in Montana. His mom was super educated, taught him, homeschooled, it sounded like. The dad was a naval officer. Um, he, the dad took uh, L. Ron Hubbard as a young boy, traveled to like far east. So as a young kid, you know, who gets to go there uh, being so young? He's almost like a child prodigy, becomes one of the top Boy Scouts in America. Um, from there, uh, he learns all about, you know, the, the medicines and the ancient traditions in the Far East. Then in his college years, he goes to the, the United States on the West or the East Coast and starts learning about physics and nuclear physics. Um, World War II happens and he starts, he becomes a naval officer um, suffers some injuries, and then next thing you know, he's one of the most prolific sci-fi writers that there is, specializing in pulp fiction, writing everything from mysteries to romance to westerns, everything. And eventually, because of what he had encountered, he come up with he came up with Dianetics. Dianetics again. Uh, Dia is Greek from what I understood, meaning through, and then I think it was nos, which would be Greek for through the mind or through the soul. So with Dianetics, it was what the mind or the soul is working with the body. Again, analytical mind versus the reactive mind. So again, L. Ron Hubbard, he looks like an absolute amazing person. Uh, when you visit this church. Um, a couple other things as I go through here. Um, the chaplain, I was also in the library section for a little bit, and he showed me, um, and I can't remember what this was called. And again, I'm, there's, I'm sure there's more information online that you can find uh, when it comes to the more advanced type of Scientology. This is just what happens if you walk off the street. So he's showing me like the different rungs of a ladder that you ha that you can obtain to go clear within Scientology. And from what I've understood, it typically it costs money uh, to do so. But you know, like he was trying to get me interested and, and I could tell like because I'm not biting, he didn't kind of press it anymore. But he did give me uh, this this order form uh, within their library. And on the order form, and I'll, I'll include a picture on this, it includes everything when it comes to uh, L. Ron Hubbard's books and lectures. You can buy them and have them sent out to you. The most surprising one to me, just have to find the page here, was you could buy the Legacy Collection, which consisted of 19 books and 14 lectures. Um, well, I guess actually 1,500 lectures and six film lectures on DVD. And the price on that was $11,000, which was at a 42.5% discount of the normal price of $19,315. So I've heard people talk about how expensive Scientology can get. Um, when I saw that, and now granted, no one asked me for any money when I was there for my first visit. This was like a first date, you know? If the guy always pays on the first date, Scientology, like they were not gonna ask me for money um, when it came to this. But with the order form, I could kind of tell pretty quick, like it could get pretty expensive pretty fast. Uh, by diving into it. Um, afterwards, um, with the DVDs, um, you could walk out of, out of there with as many free DVDs as you wanted. Um, I watched the Scientology overview. Um, really interesting to watch. They go, the very first thing that they go into is L. Ron Hubbard, you know, going into the creed of the church, what Scientologists say about Scientology. 
Uh, they go into a couple of Scientologists when it comes to like their different careers. There's no Tom Cruise. There's no John Travolta, which was kind of disappointing. But the, th the funny thing is, it's like, it was all beautiful people. Like if you, like there wasn't one ugly person when it came to this, this type of DVD. Just strange to me. Um, also, uh, so I watched some of those when I got home. And then two to three months later, I got a little uh, mailer from the church that uh, I was very intrigued to see what they were going to, to send me. And with the literature, it was like all the same, same image of these three co-workers, all beautiful people again. And every single little flyer on this promoted a personal efficiency course. It had nothing to do with God or spirituality or anything like that. It solely focused on what you can be experiencing as challenges within the workplace. So the one that I thought was quite interesting was this flyer that said, how, how efficient are you? And you'd have to take a test of 10 different questions um, just to give you an example of 10 of these questions, they're all yes or no's. Do you ever wish you could be more productive and organized? Do you think that being successful would change your life for the better? Do you ever feel that your relationships with coworkers could be improved with better communication? Do you sometimes lack the confidence to ask for what you want? Does the thought of being more efficient, creating better relationships and having more success excite you. So you get the point, but if you answered yes to three or less, you could have a couple specific personal efficiency issues that you may want to overcome. If you answered yes to four or seven of the questions, you could have a detrimental lack of efficiency that is causing you to be upset in life. And if you answered yes to eight or 10 of the questions, you most likely experience pain frustration, and consequences from your current efficiency skills. So what to do about your results? Take the personal efficiency course um, that's been designed for and used by tens of thousands of people. So I thought that was interesting because, again, it's more focused on workplace, more at your job. How do you become better uh, for yourself and become better at work rather than how do you become better within your own spirituality? Which I thought was really different considering what you typically get from other churches. Other churches, they may do programs when it comes to finance courses or uh, relationship type of courses. I know one church I went to did divorce courses, but this was completely different because it focused all about the workplace. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it when it comes to Scientology. Uh, in the book with the chapter... Uh, much more, I kind of dive a little bit more into my visit there. This is more of a show and tell uh, to kind of see what they offer to me just coming in as a one-time visitor. So that's going to do it for me today. Uh, this is David Boyce with 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. Uh, again, if you'd like to support, uh, hit the like button and subscribe for future content. And again, the book, 52 Churches in 52 Weeks, is on Amazon. Check it out if you like to read. So thanks for watching and hope you have a good rest of your day.